Good morning. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we meet and we learn from each other today on country. I'm here at the State Library of New South Wales, so I'm on Gadigal land, and I pay my sincere respects to Elders past, present and emerging here on Gadigal land and also on lands across New South Wales, wherever you might be joining us here this morning. So good morning and welcome to Bad Sydney 2021. It's delightful to be here with people in 3D and to have all of you here at the State Library of New South Wales in our Metcalf Auditorium and also people joining us online via Zoom. Uh, some of you are at work, at home or joining us from one of the public libraries across the state. Thank you all very much for coming. My name is Rachel Franks. I'm the coordinator of scholarship here at the library and I have a bit of a side hustle in crime research. So it is a treat to be here this morning with Kel Richards, who is well known to many of you through his numerous books. I'm not even going to say how many books you've written because I'll feel quite embarrassed. And many years um, coming to us at home and at work uh, via ABC. So today he's going to be talking to us about his latest book. But before we get chatting, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, you would have already noticed that we are strictly following all of our COVID protocols. Um, we've all checked in with QR codes. Everybody here is fully vaccinated. We've got hand sanitizer stuff everywhere. Um, if you are feeling unwell, please just check in with one of our friendly volunteers. Um, that would be terrific. And we're asking that people keep their masks on while we're all together. As speakers, we'll keep our masks off while we're on stage, and that will make it easier for you to hear us or lip read us if you need to do that as well. We'll be taking questions after our conversation this morning. If you're here in real life, if you'd like to take your mask off while you ask that question and then pop it straight back on, that would be terrific. And if you are joining us via Zoom, please use the chat feature this morning. You can just type your question in and we'll be stopping about 45 minutes in, maybe a little bit before, um, and we'll get through as many of your questions as we can. If you're a social media festival goer, um, don't forget to use the hashtag uh, Bad Crime Sydney, and of course, the Twitter handle for the festival is at Bad Crime Sydney. Uh, please turn your phones off or at least use shush um, and that way everyone can enjoy this morning. So, Kel, thank you for coming in. It's great to have you. Um, if you haven't seen Kel's book, I'm going to um, hold it up. I think it has one of the best true crime covers that we've seen in the last 18 months, nearly two years. It is um, quite a fabulous cover. So first up, Flash Jim, how do we pronounce his name? I think I've been getting it wrong. Well, you might be getting it wrong, but you might be getting it right. And there's actually no way to know. Uh, his surname is V-A-U-X. So how do you pronounce V-A-U-X? Well, there are a number of options. There is some evidence that in the England of his time, it was pronounced Vaux to rhyme with Hawks. So he might have said Vaux. I mean, that's a possibility. Uh, he might have used the French pronunciation and said "vo." I think that's the one I've been using. Right. Well, you're, you're welcome to go and use it because <laughs> we don't know what the right one is. Right? It's, all, it's all guesswork. Uh, since we've all the audio recordings from the late 18th, early 19th century have all disappeared. So uh, we, it is guesswork that we're working on here. Uh, he did use James Lowe as a, one of his students. He kept changing his names. He was a con man. So he, he worked under lots of different names. So if he used low, does that mean he chose it because it rhymed with Vaux? Possibly. But his grandfather's name was James Lowe. So it might not be a clue after all. So we just don't know. I, I tell you how I, I pronounce it Vox. And I'll tell you why. When I was growing up, there was a brand of motor car called a Vauxhall. And the Vox, the first syllable of Vauxhall is V-A-U-X. And I look at V-A-U-X and I remember the motor cars. So I say Vox. I call him James Hardy Vox. But you have his license, I think because he never told us how he pronounced it, uh, how, how to pronounce it, say it any how you like. So if we actually spend the next hour with me talking about James Hardy Vox and Rachel talking about James Hardy Vaux, it will work perfectly. 
I think I'm going to comply and I'm going to call him Fox for at least the next <laughs> hour. So a man, who, he's pretty shady and he does have a lot of names. How did you find him in the first place? I found him through the language because I started 30, 35 years ago as a journalist making language a specialty and studying language. And so I came into um, the discovery of convict slang which is actually quite important in, in the Australian language. Uh, do you, are you familiar with a thing called Talk Like a Pirate Day? 19th of September every year, invented by two young Americans. Uh, they made it up as a parody of, of uh, all the United Nations words of the day, but it took off. So now they use it to raise money for children's charities. At Talk Like a Pirate Day, you're meant to go into the office and say things like, oh, you me hearties, and oh, you Jim lad, and a varst there, and things like that. You need to put on a funny accent and say funny words. If we had a talk like a convict day, we wouldn't have to change. If you're an Aussie and you're speaking ordinary Aussie English, you are talking like a convict, because our language is full of hundreds of convict words. If you're if you're offered the bowl of fruit salad and you say, I'll have a, a dollop of ice cream on that, dollop is a convict word. If someone says, have you got enough sausages for the barbie on Saturday? Oh, I've got swags. Swag is a convict word. If someone's done something really well and you say, oh, that's a bang up job. Bang up is a convict expression. There are hundreds of them and they pepper Australian, uh, the Australian form of English, our dialect, to this day. We are all talking like convicts all the time. When I realised that, I became very interested and interested in how we know that's the case. And we only know that's the case because this crook and charlatan, and as, as Rachel said, he was a real crook. If he came around to dinner, he was a great storyteller. He would have kept your dinner party really entertained. But afterwards, if you shook hands, you'd want to check your wrist and make sure the wristwatch is still there. Right? He was that kind of person. Very, very glib, uh, great raconteur, very entertaining, able to you know, invent on, a, on the in a moment's notice what he needed to to get through a situation but uh he was a he was a deceiver he was a, a thief a fraudster all his life but the one thing he did was in 1812 when he was in the convict colony of uh, newcastle which was the place where secondary offenders sent he was sent he, he'd come out here uh the second time he'd come out here and then he offended again and so he was sent to newcastle which at the time was called the hell of new south wales and I said that to uh, Bob Hughes once, and he said, still is, Kel, still is, I think, which is very unkind. I don't believe that for a minute. Um, so it was, a, it was a tough place. There were coal mines there. It had been called Coal River, and then they changed the name to Newcastle, uh, and he was put to work in the coal mines, and he wanted to get out of the coal mines, so he sat down and he wrote a dictionary because the, the language used by the convicts was a language called Flash, uh, developed in London amongst the criminal classes, started as code so they could talk to each other in the presence of constables and magistrates and not be understood but they used it so often uh, that it became part of their everyday language and it was the way they conversed and they were not able to converse in any other way because he came from a good middle class family he had standard english and he had to learn flash as a second language he was a quite a rare creature in that he understood flash uh, and he could he could translate and in fact, the, the, the uh, commandant of the Newcastle convict colony, a man named Thomas Scotto, Lieutenant Thomas Scotto, used to get him in when he was sitting as a magistrate so that he could translate the evidence of the convicts. So uh, what did he mean by that, Vox? Or however Scotto pronounced it, I don't know that either. Uh, and Vox would translate. So he thought, if I sit down and write a little dictionary of this flash language and give it to him, he'll take me out of the mines and he'll give me a soft job. And he had his iron sitting at a clerk's stool in the uh, a quartermaster's store doing a pen and paper job. That was, it. and it worked. He did actually get out of the mines and he got his soft job. But that's how the very first dictionary ever written in Australia was written. That's a pretty good gig, isn't it? I mean, to be able to conceive that, you know, you're a convict and you're working in a coal mine, not everybody would sort of sit back over breakfast and think, oh, I know, I'll just write a book because that'll be easy <laughs> and that'll get me out of trouble. But you mentioned that when he was in Newcastle, that was the second time he was out here. Yes. Now, I've come across a few convicts, but this guy comes out here, not by choice, three times. Can you tell us a little bit about why he didn't learn 
Um, he was a clever man who could invent on the spur of the moment, but he had the maturity of a 15 year old. He never understood the consequences. He always took reckless chances. So he came out here first in 1808, uh, 1808, well before the end, no, 1808 was when his first term ended, came out in 1801. Um, uh, then he got to go back. Uh, look, can I read you a little bit from book? Can I do a reading? Let's, so, let's have a reading. That's always fun. Hang on for a second. Now, everyone who's my age will understand reading glasses. He's just getting his glasses for everyone tuning in at home. So. Box, just to give you some background, came from a nice middle-class family. Uh, his grandfather, James Lowe, was in the law, uh, had a respectable practice uh, in the Inns of Court in London. Uh, his father was a butler in a grand house. Uh, his uh, grandparents, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lowe, rather were never happy with the person that uh, James of Ox's mother had chosen to marry, because although he was a, a, a butler in a really good house, he was definitely below stairs and they were above stairs so they were never quite happy about that there was always a bit of a distance there James Lowe retired to Shifnal uh, in Shropshire and, and shortly after James Lowe was uh, James Fox was born uh, his family moved there as well and he actually ended up being brought up more by his grandfather and grandmother than his own parents but he grew up in a, in a, a comfortable middle class background uh, he was given a good education uh, sent to a prep school uh, then sent to a grammar school. He was literate, which very few convicts were. Um, and so he had that sort of background, but he chose a life of crime pretty much consciously. He was sent to be an apprentice to, a, uh, to Liverpool, to a, a haberdasher, haberdasher's shop. Haberdashery being a word that is not much used anymore. Um, so he, he worked and he, he, so he spent a lot of his time putting his hand in the till and, and then till he was sent back home in disgrace. And then he persuaded his grandfather to send him to London, uh, you know, trying him out as, as a law clerk. So his grandfather wrote him a reference and got an old friend to take him on as a law clerk. And after three months, he was sacked because he was living this dissipated lifestyle out late at night, coming in very late, um, still slightly drunk and uh, stealing whatever he could. He was 15 at the time. And so he knew that he Only was... Only slightly drunk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he, he managed to get away with an amazing amount of things. He used to do things like going into a, um, uh, into a gentleman's tailor shop. And because he, was, he spoke like a gentleman and looked like a gentleman, he'd order clothes and buy them and walk out, never intending to pay, just disappearing, because he knew he was too young to be prosecuted. So he developed this life of crime and he'd gradually given up on regular work and he'd fallen in with uh, the professional criminal classes. Uh, he was learning their language. He was working with them as a pickpocket. Pickpockets op offered, operated in teams before he learnt the skill of being a pickpocket himself uh, or dipping his forks. Your forks are your two fingers. Uh, that's what you dip into someone's pockets. And that's why, by the way, hands are called your dukes because they're Duke of York's, they're forks. It's rhyming slang. Um, so he, before he'd learnt that skill, he would act as cover and the cover hovered near the person doing the pickpocketing and received the stolen goods uh, so that the, the pickpocket, there's a, not me, I'm innocent, look here, search me, I'm okay. So he'd fallen into that life, but it all came apart on Sunday, the 17th of August, 1800, when Bromley, uh, a friend of Vox's who was doing the pickpocketing and Vox, after breakfasting together, decided to take a walk in the city. At about one o'clock, they entered Cheapside and saw a large, curious crowd gathered around a shop front with broken shutters, apparently the result of an attempt to break and enter. To Bromley, a crowd like this was a temptation he could not resist. Vox advised his friend against launching a pickpocket attack and started to walk away. He'd not gone far when he turned around to see Bromley struggling in the iron grip of a man who was calling out to another pedestrian, stop, sir, come back, you've been robbed. The person who'd been hailed in this way turned around and retraced his steps, muttering, robbed? Robbed, you say? Then he patted his pockets and cried out in a startled tone, you're quite right, sir. My handkerchief is gone. Then as he patted a little further, his alarm increased. Uh, my pocketbook, 
My pocketbook is missing. Thank you, sir. The villain is captured. My property is recovered. I'm in your debt, sir. At the same moment, the man holding Bromley saw how much interest Vox was taking in the incident and called out, stop him in the blue coat. That's the other. Believing he was innocent of any crime, Vox did not attempt to flee. In a minute, he felt his collar seized and his feet sliding over the cobblestones as he was dragged back towards the crowd. I've got you, my lad, growled the large man holding him. I know how you thieves operate. I've seen your kind before. One of you does the stealing, the other helps. That's what I reckon happened in this case. The man who'd seized Bromley turned out to be Charles Alderman, a turnkey or prison guard at the Poultry Compter, a nearby prison, and also a city a constable. This is before the launch of the Metropolitan Police in 1829. So a constable in those days was basically a tradesman uh, or a shopkeeper. Uh, they were not paid for their law enforcement. They're a bit like our volunteer firefighters in that sense. Mind you, they could be paid if they got a conviction. So they were very keen to, to get convictions. The other arresting officer was his brother, Edward, also a turnkey and a city constable. The aldermans had once marched the two young men off to their lockup. Uh, now, the, the paltry compter, compter is an old word for counter, uh, and it was used for people who had fallen into debt. So it was, it was a debtor's prison originally, and the poultry was named because of that's what the trade was there originally. I mean, there are the streets around it called milk and bread and things like that. On arrival at the prison, Vox and Bromley were both searched and all their personal property put to one side on the assumption that it had all been stolen. They were then locked up together and had some leisure to talk over the whole miserable business. Just not fair, Vox moaned. I had nothing to do with napping that clout. In fact, if you remember, Bromley, I told you not to do it. I said it didn't look like a safe place for buzzing. Shaking his head sadly, Bromley said, I agree. Yes, you did. Sorry, I didn't listen. I shouldn't be here, said Vox. It's so unfair. But you've got to be honest, James. There are plenty of times you've taken things and not got caught. This sort of makes up for them. Besides, we got nibbed. We've got to get nibbed sometimes, don't we? But, 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 spluttered Vox in indignation. This time I've been taken when I'm innocent. With a chuckle, Bromley replied, is there really any time when you are entirely innocent? Uh, what we were out walking, what we were out, what were we out walking for, eh? For a chance at something, that's what. Oh, it's an injustice. That's what it is, a blatant case of injustice. I do agree with you, old chum. You've been unfairly treated this time. So I'll tell you what, when we appear in court, I'll tell them I don't know you, so I've never seen you before, never even set eyes on you, and that should be enough to get you off. Uh, you're a decent chap, Alexander, said Vox, and the two shook hands on the deal. That was how he was caught the first time. It resulted in seven years penal servitude in the distant colony of New South Wales. So he didn't get off. He didn't get off. So he comes out here and he stays in Sydney the first time. What happens to him once he's actually a convict and he's here in New South Wales on his first excursion out? Uh, Vox was terrified of hard work, right? So <laughs> he would, and the idea of, you know, doing hard manual labour, which is what most convicts did, really appalled him. So he used the fact that he was literate. He could read and write. He had some experience in offices. He'd worked in offices. He knew how to keep accounts and how to copy documents. Uh, he had, had a good, fair copper plate handwriting, as they said in those days. So he talked his way into various clerical jobs. Um, he was sent uh, by Governor Philip Gidley King out to a property out at what was called the Hunter District in those days, now Windsor. Uh, and he worked on a, a large property, but he kept the records for the owner of the property. And then later, Samuel Marsden, who was the first, second Anglican chaplain to New South Wales and, and also had a large farm at Parramatta and was the magistrate for Parramatta as well and several other things. He did a lot of things, Marsden. Uh, Marsden was told to take part in the first muster of the colony. Uh, because it was a military settlement, muster was the word they used for a census. So they were taking a muster. Uh, and he had a clerk, but the clerk wasn't up to that job. It was too difficult. And he'd heard how good this bloke was at his book work and that kind of so he actually asked for vox to be uh, transferred to him to do the muster so he's got a lot of firsts this bloke he took part in the first census ever taken in the colony he wrote the first dictionary ever published in the colony he wrote the first autobiography ever written in the colony so he's got i mean he was a thoroughly scurrilous person but he's got all these 
first facade is known. So he took part in that, and then he Marsden asked him to become his permanent clerk of the court uh, in Parramatta. He did that for a while. Then King finished his term as governor, and uh, he was replaced by Bly of the Bounty. And when King was going back to England, he needed someone on board who could do that kind of work, do the clerical work. He had to sort out all of his papers to deliver to the colonial office. So he, in, uh, Vox was almost at the end of his seven years, about 11 months short. And he said to Vox, uh, you can come with me. Now, normally, when you finished your seven years, you just stayed in New South Wales. There was no way of getting back to England. That was the end of it. You were here forever. But in Vox's case, he was offered a, a, a voyage. Free trip home. Free trip home on a ship called the Buffalo uh, with Philip Gidley King. Marsden and his family were going back on furlough. Uh, and so he, got, he went back. He was back about a year and he was caught again and he was back out here for the second time. So uh, he just he couldn't he just could not go straight to save himself. So the second time is when he writes the dictionary. Yes. And is that when he does his autobiography as well? Which of those books comes first? The diction, little dictionary comes first. Yeah. So we know he wrote that in 1812 and he gave it to uh, Thomas Scotto, who was the commandant at Newcastle. And at the back of this book, Flash Jim, uh, I've reprinted the whole of his little dictionary. The value of that is, after you've read his story, you can actually hear his voice. There's the introduction to Thomas Scotto, which is, which is groveling with a capital G. I mean, it is simpering, uh, psychophant sort of stuff. But when you read that, this is how he played up to people in authority, people in power. And it worked for him. It, it achieved a lot of things for him over the years. Then when you read the dictionary and the entries, and he's explaining what words mean, we're actually hearing the voice of James Hardy Vox, which I think is quite nice. That was 1812. And we know he gave those pages to Scotto. Some little time after that, uh, possibly three or four years after that, he was invited to put down his life story, probably by Thomas Thompson, who replaced Scotto at Newcastle as the commandant. My assumption is, we don't know, but my assumption is they heard him telling stories about his life and the things that had happened to him. And he was a great raconteur and very colourful, interesting things had happened to him. So the, someone, one of them said, and my guess is it was Thomas Thompson, said, you've got to write all that down. That's too good to lose, Vox. That's a really... So he did. He wrote his memoirs. Then the combined document, the combined manuscript of the memoirs and the dictionary... Uh, were both delivered to Baron Field, who was a, uh, an early judge, and he's 29 years old and been sent out from England uh, to be a, a judge in the court here. Uh, and Field had literary pretensions. Uh, he was a friend of Lee Hunt, the essayist, and he'd written for Lee Hunt's magazine. He'd written some poetry fairly badly, uh, and he'd written a lot of essays and a commentary on Blackstone's <laughs> laws. <laughs> <laughs> well, he published the first book of poetry ever written yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which was called, do you remember, Rachel? Oh, is it Fields of something? Someone at home will know. Yes. Okay. Tell us. Use, use the, the, the little tag on the side of the, the Zoom and tell us the name of uh, Fresh leaves from a foreign land. Something str I can't remember. Anyway, Field had these literary connections. His publisher was the famous John Murray, great publisher. He got that book and he sent Vox's book and one other book. A, written, a, a book of exploration written by John Oxley, the explorer, and sent both manuscripts to John Murray, his publisher in London, and said, look, the, the Oxley book is really worth publishing. The other one is a terribly scurrilous book, but it will make money for you, so you should publish that as well. They were both published 1819. So 1819 was the time when our first dictionary, first autobiography appeared in print, and that's how we know so much about the first 33 years of Vox's life. Now, I'm assuming he would have made more money out of publishing than Baronfield, made out of his poetry. Was that enough to keep him out of trouble for a little while? He had absolutely no idea how to budget. He's like one of our teenage daughters, right? I've got no idea how to manage money. Um, he made, it was £33.17 and sixpence, something like that. It was roughly the equivalent of about $5,000 in our money. Bad. So it was good. It was good. And it would have got him, he was often in debt. He was a compulsive gambler. So it would have got him out of trouble for the time being. Um, but it was never enough. So it didn't get him out of trouble for long. So he comes out a third time. Well, the, the, the second time, can, can I tell the story of the second time? Yep. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
when he went back after when the buffalo arrived back in England, there are a whole lot of complicating factors involved in that, and the story is a, a great story it's in the book. Uh, but uh, back in London, he went back to his old way of life, uh, and he, he met up with Alexander Bromley, his old his old comrade in arms, and he worked out this method of robbing jewellery shops. He had this gentle, really handsome gentleman's coat with especially made enlarged sleeves. So he'd go into a, a jeweler shop or a pawn shop and ask to inspect various things. Um, and because he then had the sleight of hand touch, several of them would end up in his sleeves and he might buy some small thing or take the card and say, I'll come back later. He, he was doing the posh gentleman thing. And then he'd go outside and then transfer the loot to Bromley, uh, who'd look after it to make sure if there was any hue and cry, he wouldn't be caught. So that's what he, and then at night he was going to the theatres and in the, because he loved the theatre. Uh, and in the theatres, he was, uh, using the jostling crowd to do a lot of um, pocket picking. So he'd gone back to his old way of life and he met a young woman named Mary. She was 19, he was 25. Uh, she'd been working as a prostitute. They took to each other like glue immediately. They just thought each other were terrific. She moved in with him. Uh, and then a little while later, she became pregnant and they got married. Uh, and, she, and she then played a role because he went round to these jewelry shops for the hus as a husband and wife very respectable. I mean, how can you suspect a husband and wife of dishonest or criminal? Couldn't happen. Um, uh, and, but it was, he was always running close to the wind. Could I read another little bit? Is that okay? Let's have another reading. Now, this is, uh, this would be no more than a year after he'd got back. It was in October, by which time Mary was well advanced in her pregnancy. The couple went to the Drury Lane Theatre, owned by the famous British playwright Richard Brinsley Sheridan, which burnt down only a year after they were there, after their adventure there. After the performance, they were descending the stairs. That's when the crowd is thickest. That's when you can dip your forks into other people's pockets. And as they descended the stairs, Vox attempted to lift a man's pocketbook. The victim detected what was happening. Hey, you there, he shouted, turning on Vox. What do you think you're up to? Me, sir? I'm not up to anything, sir. Oh, yes, you are. You had your hand in my pocket, I'm certain of it. Vox strongly protested his innocence, but his would-be victim turned to the crowd on the stairs around and said, you gentlemen should check your pockets. Do so at once. This creature has been here among us, and who knows what he's been up to. A very large gentleman held Vox firmly by the arm while everyone in the immediate vicinity searched their coat pockets. Soon a chorus of voices sprang up. My pocketbook's missing, so is mine. I'm certain this chap was right beside me just a moment ago. Pushed forward by the departing theatre crowd into Little Russell Street, Vox soon found himself surrounded by an angry mob of some 20 or more gentlemen, all accusing him of theft and saying he should be taken in charge. Mary stood on the outskirts of the crowd with the pocketbooks that her husband had stolen and he'd passed on to her and were hidden in her flowing gown. She trembled, terrified at what might happen to her dear James. Vox knew he was safe in the sense that he'd already passed on everything that he'd stolen to his wife and he used his utmost persuasive powers to pretend to be affronted by these outrageous accusations. He protested he was a gentleman of character. He offered to give them his card or to send for respectable persons who knew him or even to retire with his accusers to a coffee shop and discuss their claims more quietly. This time, none of it worked. Nobody listened to him. And then just when things were getting desperate, one of Vox's old Botany Bay acquaintances turned up. This man had been working the same pickpocket racket at the same theatre. And like Vox, he had the manner and appearance of a gentleman of leisure. This being a vital part, of course, of the whole operation. Vox never names him in his memoirs, but it's known that the most distinguished pickpocket who ever spent time in New South Wales was Robert Brady, alias Hazard, alias Bill Soames, alias Oxford Bob. They all had lots of aliases. So this may be the man who it was. It may have been someone else. We just don't know. But it was an ex-convict friend. The man rescued Vox by stepping up to his side and loudly insisting that Vox's accusers must be mistaken. This was clearly a gentleman. And furthermore, a gentleman who had offered his address and offered references 
and they should be very wary of any impropriety of taking the law into their own hands. And then turning to Vox and adopting a haughty tone, the man said, come, sir, you have been sufficiently insulted and have been far too long detained on a charge for which I am confident there is no foundation. Allow me to conduct you away from this spot. If you're going towards St. James, I shall be glad of the company. Well, let me see. And at this point, he raised both his voice and his cane. Let me see he will dare to insult you further. And with these words, he led Vox away in triumph. Mary, however, was greatly agitated and trembling with emotion, so much so that although she and Vox lived only 200 yards from the theatre, she collapsed unconscious as soon as they reached their apartment. The shock was so severe, the next day she gave premature birth <clears throat> to their baby, a little boy who lived only eight hours. So the whole, which is a very sad part of the story, um, the whole of his time there was spent running close to the wind uh, and he was constantly reckless. He, at one stage, there was a, a clear description of him being circulated to pawnbrokers. He used them as fences. So he had to leave the part of London he was in and they found a, a, a little place to live in over near Blackfly, somewhere over in Suffolk anyway. Uh, so he's keeping away from where he used to be, but he decided he wanted to go back there. Mary was terrified, but he wanted to go back there to one of the inns that he knew to see his old friends, to set up some other operation. And when he did, he was taken by constables. And this time, because what they'd caught him for was stealing jewellery of enormous value. Anything over a shilling was a capital offence. So anything worth more than a shilling, you were hung from the neck until dead. So uh, with, with the on the first occasion, the gentleman who made the complaint against him suddenly discovered that this was the, the, the first time he went, suddenly discovered that this young man was facing the death penalty and said, no, no, the handkerchief was only worth 11 pence. So he was sent out for seven years. The, the second time, it was jewellery. It was worth a great deal of money and there was no way anything like that could happen. He was found guilty, sentenced to death. And then like a lot of prisoners in those days, the death sentence was commuted, sometimes commuted to life, um, uh, life as a prisoner overseas or 14 years. He got life and he came out for the second time. And that's when all of this writing happened. Well, if you had a life sentence, you certainly would be wanting to try and find a slightly easier day job than, than hauling coal and cutting coal. <laughs> yes, you would. So it's interesting that you, you talked about his, um, I don't want to give too much away, but you've mentioned his first wife. Yes. So even though it's this story where you can sort of kind of write him off a little bit as an eccentric or a bit of a lovable rogue, but there's there's quite a little bit of tragedy in his life at various points because not only is he transported three times, uh, three is actually a special number for our lad and he has three wives as well. Do you think bigamously? Well, maybe they were just common law wives as we would have said in those days. It's, it's really uncertain. When he was in Newcastle, he married again. He married another convict. Uh, she was an Irish um, woman who'd, who'd come out here. And we are not told in his memoirs what had happened to Mary. So had Mary died? We don't know. More likely, Vox had just conveniently forgotten that he had a, a wife back in London and just got married again bigamously. And then a bit later, he got married a third time. Uh, now, when he got married the third time, again to another a convict lass and again to an Irish lass, um, he was using one of his pseudonyms. He was calling himself James Lowe at the time, which is why the records may not have caught up with the fact that this bloke kept on marrying people. Uh, but yes, he, he did marry three times. And what happened to all those, those women, we just don't know. I don't think they did well out of their connection with Vox. I'm shocked. <laughs> um, let's leave his life just for a little bit and start talking a bit more about the language and, you know, all the different fabulous words that he's documented. Even though you have a background in language and you've had a long curiosity with words and how we use them, were you surprised at how many words were in this dictionary that we still use every day? Oh, startled. Yes. Yes. The, uh, the examples that I would give you, like dollop. I mean, who would think that dollop was a convict word? I knew swag was. Um, because it, that's often spoken of as being a convict word. Originally, a swag, a swag was a bundle, usually a bundle of stolen things. But then it was applied to people who did itinerant bushwork, and they carried a bundle, and it was called a swag. So they were called swag, swagmen, and then swaggies. Uh, 
And then we got the most famous swaggy of all who jumped into the billabong to escape being caught. Um, and we've been singing about him ever since. So that's quite famous as a crime, but a lot of them are just so, uh, so, so normal, so, so much part of our conversation. I was startled at how many convict words are still part of the Australian language. And I was surprised too at how old some of the words were. So some words like pins for a set of legs. Yes. I yep. actually thought that was like a, a noir or 1940s <laughs> invention. Yes. So I was really surprised to see that in this dictionary and that it was much older. You're right. You're right. When I was a, a boy at school, uh, your, your nose was often called your conch. Well, that's a convict word. Um, to bolt, to run away, to leave a place suddenly, uh, to bustle, to do things quickly, hurriedly, bustling around, to cadge. I mean, we use that today. If someone keeps borrowing things, we say, oh, you're real cadger. We're talking like a convict when we do that. Um, uh, cheese it is an interesting one. If you tell someone to cheese it, you're telling them to run away. I can remember saying that in the school grounds a long time ago. Uh, whether the kids still do, I don't know. Chum? I mean, chum is an expression for a fellow convict, um, cleaned out, was used in his day mainly of gamblers. When a gambler had lost all he had, he was cleaned out, but we could use that any time. He used the word bean to mean a guinea. Now, we, we have stretched that out to mean any money. So if, we, if I say I haven't got a bean, it means I've got no money. But that comes from him. Uh, when you call your clothes your duds, using a convict word, if you call them your togs, it was a, a that, the, the word togs as a convict slang word, uh, the linguists, the real linguists that I report on, they tell me that it actually is a, was a, a slang version of toga. So it started out as your toga and everyone uh, had heard, heard about ancient Roman history and knew about togas, so they became your togs. You just abbreviated it. Uh, offense is a receiver of stolen goods and flash. I don't think flash ever quite disappeared. We, we talk about someone looking pretty flash or as flash as a rat with a gold tooth, or as flash as a fox doctor's clerk. Um, we, so the amount really surprised me. Are there any words that you think should be used more? Because um, quite a few have fallen out of fashion. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah quite a few have. Uh, there are some that I, I read in here, and I think it's a pity that we lost that. It's pretty, we don't, we don't have those things anymore. Uh, I'm just trying to. Uh, I mean, to ding meant to throw or throw away. Now we talk about getting dings in the car. It, it's not unrelated. And it seems to me it, it, it is quite possibly a descendant of that use of ding. Um, uh, if you had false dice that all, would always produce the numbers you wanted, they were called dispatches. Um, Crab shells were shoes. A Charlie was a watchman. A Charlie Ken was a, a chant is interesting. It's got several, some of these words had multiple meanings. So a chant was a person's name uh, or designation. So a thief who assumes a feigned name on his apprehension to avoid being known or a swindler who gives a false address is said to tip a queer chant because queer meant criminal. Um, chant was also a cipher or initials or mark of any kind. So you stole something, you got rid of the chant. So that there was no there was no uh, imprint on the on the plate or whatever it was. Chant was also an advertisement in a newspaper or a handbill, particularly one looking for uh, stolen property or a person who did the thieving. And if there's a reward held out, then the person whose name is on it is said to be chanted. So I, I think I think there are lots and lots of really interesting expressions here, uh, which I some of which I they called cheese cares I don't know why I, what I like quite quite a lot was carry the keg a man who was very easily vexed or put out of humor by any joke and can't take a joke is said to carry the keg so it's a bit like a man who's got a chip on his shoulder all the time he's carrying not carrying just a chip but the whole keg carry the keg and then because they like to play with words and they made jokes out of their own expressions if he was someone who carried the keg he was a walking distiller now, I, one of the things that Philip Henschler, the English novelist, uh, once said that the Australian language is one of the most colourful dialects uh, of the English language on earth. And part of it's got to do with the fact that Australians are good at, at playing with words and having fun with the words. And that began here. It began with the convicts. 
And something that I think is really interesting when I was, you know, reading um, Flash Jim's story and looking at the, the words in his dictionary, you, we have, you know, a lot of um, talk and there's this idea in the popular imagination that, you know, we need to hold tightly to our language and stop it from being corrupted or losing some of its charm. But I actually think looking at that and looking at some of the words that you've talked about today, and there are many, many more in the book, it's actually surprisingly stable. You're, you're absolutely right. Some yep. for a little bit. Yep. But the fact that we've held on to, to slang and normalised it to such an extent, it's really... Is it particularly Australian, do you think? I think we're, I think at some level, maybe at a fairly deep level, we are aware of how distinctive our language is and determined not to lose it. The encouraging thing is we are not the damn dumb language slaves of America. So people worry about Americanization all the time, ain't happening. This may trigger a question. So if you're sitting at home, you're in the auditorium and you're starting to think about language questions, uh, start them ticking over in your mind because you'll get a chance to ask them in a few minutes time. What I can tell you about the Australian language is it's as bright as a box of budgies and it's as strong as a Mallee bull. It's, it, our language changes, but that's because it's a living language. Only dead languages don't change. And the fact that it's changing is a sign of life. It's not a sign of death. So uh, people nowadays would not use uh, some old expressions. One of the expressions common uh, from the convicts was code. Originally, the person who was in charge of a place was the boss code. He ran the station or he was the, the commander. He was the code. Then it came to apply to any person, a bit like a bloke. Um, and then it, I think it's dropped out of use now. Now, now they were still using code when I was a boy. Cove has gone. But the people who use that never talked about budgie smugglers. Bits come into the language, bits go out of the language. But it's because it's a living language. I have a preference. <laughs> I think we'd, I'd rather have cove than budgie smugglers. <laughs> yes. We, well, so, some of the new things that come in are quite nice. Um, I, I, I asked someone, I was out in, the, out, out in the bush, and I asked someone if it was a long way away, the place. And he said, oh, mate, it's a cut lunch and a water bag away. So, you know, it's a long way. No, no, that's, that's the ability to turn a phrase. And that's part of what we do. Uh, how Australians have got that, I think, is partly because, uh, thank you, Rachel, partly because uh, we became very aware of language. Can I very quickly tell you the four pillars theory? The four pillars theory is that the Australian language de developed very early. There is evidence that it existed by the 1830s. Now that's 50 years after the colony was established. This is for a new dialect of English to emerge as fast as that is most unusual. But in the 1830s, a businessman from England who came up to set up a business in Hobart advertised in the local paper for someone to come and teach his sons the local language because he wanted them to be able to fit in. That's 50 years after the colony started. Now I think there are four pillars on which that distinctive uh, Australian language was built. The first is indigenous words because we had to name a whole lot of things we, that looked really strange, that looked as though they'd been glued together out of a duck and something else and something else. So to find names for that, we turn to, to indigenous words. And there are hundreds of indigenous words in the language. The other place where indigenous words come in are in place names. There are about 4 million place names in Australia. About three quarters of them are indigenous. So that played a role. The second big feature was uh, dialect words. English dialect, which came out here and quite often died back home. When you become an isolated uh, group of speakers of a language, disconnected from the home, words will survive that die back in the home language. So there's a whole bunch of English dialect words which became ours. Uh, the way the word bloody is used in Australia, it's, it was English originally, and the expression was originally as drunk as a blood. Uh, and bloods were uh, the sons of lords, they were blue bloods. So as drunk as a blood was the original expression. And then bloody became an expression from that. But here it became the universal adjective and it became the integrated adjective. There's a, there's a poem by John O'Grady about being down a tumba bloody rumba shoot and kanga bloody ruse. It's the kind of use of the language which was different. So we took those English dialect words uh, and then the fourth component were almost the official words of the military convict establishment. A lot of those came in. So 
uh, what would be a farm in England or a ranch in America became a station here because that's what the military have. They have stations. So those four elements are the pillars that built our language and built it very early. And one of those is this, um, this pillar that we have recorded for us so, so usefully by James Hardy Vox. It's a, it's a terrific story of a bit of a rascal doing some amazing historical work for, for all of us. I'd like to turn it over to the audience if anybody has any questions. Yes, and if you could say your question really loud. So Take off your mask first, otherwise we won't understand. Just for everybody at home, um, I have the joy of repeating all the questions. So um, as well as budgie smugglers, somebody's pointing out in the audience today, fish frighteners as a phrase. Ah, oh, so this is a great question. So what would Flash Jim think of some of our man management speak? Um, he would have struggled during the pandemic with pivot and all of the other things that we've had to cope with. Yes. Uh, and. Uh... The normal management speak like excessive caution. I mean, that's a phrase that really should be put out to pasture now and never heard again, isn't it? The interesting thing is, this was a man who fitted into his environment and he took on the colour of his environment. Now, he would never have used it in his normal conversation, certainly not with his flash friends, but I think he would have breathed that in and would have been able to do it. He would have been able to talk management talk. He would have had a consultancy. He could have told you what would happen at the bottom line, right? He would have said, well, run, up, run, up, run that up the flagpole and see who salutes. He, he was really good at taking on the colour and the feeling of where he was and playing to the people that he was talking to. So I think he would have actually, I'm not saying he would have liked it, but I think he would have used it. And he would have, he would have been, because he was clever with words, good at it. Oh, another great question. So uh, the question in the audience here in the Metcalf is motivation for the bi autobiography. I mean, there was some encouragement, but was it to boast? Was it another opportunity to scam people? Or was he trying to sanitise his own story? The interesting answer is it was both. Uh, he was very self-important. He thought that his story was worth telling. Uh, later on in the 19th century, there was a play put on about life in the convict colonies, and there was a character on stage called James Hardy Vox. He became quite famous. Uh, later, his um, John Murray lost interest in publishing his book, uh, but the uh, memoirs without the dictionary were republished a number of times, and he kept earning money out of them, and then serialised in the Newgate Calendar, which is where the picture on the front of the book comes from, the Newgate Calendar. So, and he, But he thought that's what he was entitled to. He was worth that. He was, he was a really important little person. Uh, that was his view of himself. If anyone's autobiography should be written first in his, well, it should be his, shouldn't it? Uh, but if you read it, you can hear him uh, doing the sanitising that you're talking about. He was doing both. Uh, he will describe things that he, he was engaged in, to, but I now repent of this terribly. I was an awful person then, but look how good I am now. Um, and when I was reading his uh, or memoirs in order to retell the story and use his insight, I had to keep filtering that and reminding myself this man kept telling lies he told lies the whole time so he always put himself in a good light and put others in a bad light and excused or tried to uh, play down his role in whatever was going on the, the time that he was convicted the second time in new south wales um, and was sent to newcastle there was a, a convict that he knew from the ship named edward edwards who was working for the judge advocate ellis brent and he stole from the judge advocate. I mean, these people weren't clever. If you're going to steal from anyone, you don't steal from the judge advocate. And it, but he, he then left some money and things he'd stolen with Vox. And when the constables came, Vox said, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, th this Edward Edwards, he, he left me these things to look after, and I'm very dubious about them. I'm sure they're stolen. So he pretended that he had nothing to do with it. And that's the story he tells in the autobiography. I, it wasn't me. You know, it was Edward Edwards doing all of this. But I, I don't believe him, quite frankly. I think he was in it up to his neck and that when he was convicted of uh, taking part in the thefts of Edward Edwards, it was because he was, he was part of that. He was guilty of that. So there was a lot of sanitising going on and there was a lot of I'm an important person and my story should be told going on. And as you say, with not very many people having high-level literacy skills, there were not many people available to 
uh, contradict that story who had either the talent or even the inclination to to go through and counter any of his claims um yes we've got a question here and then one up the back that is a big question. Did you want to try and paraphrase that as you answer it? So we're talking about how um, the convicts, so the people with the least power in society, are really challenging the class system by having this extraordinary influence about how we talk to each other and communicate to each other, and especially in a courtroom that, you know, the stakes are really high. So instead of the judge having you know, all the power and all the say, they're actually almost at a disadvantage in these really early years. Can you just talk a bit more about that? I think it's true that a lot of the formation of the Australian language was bottom up. It came from ordinary people because it was ordinary people who suddenly had to be aware of language. So one of the things that happened was these convicts came from all over the British Isles. And if you did a dialect map of the British Isles, it would look like a patchwork quilt. You could go to the next village and have a different dialect, different words. And suddenly people from all over the British Isles were chained to each other, digging ditches and making roads together, and they had to be able to talk to each other. So what one man called a, a shovel, another one called a, a grubbing up tool, and another one called something else, they had to learn each other's languages. A second thing happened, which I'll just mention in, in a, as an aside, and then I'll come back to what you... The other thing was they had to, to, to flatten out their accent. It's a process linguist called flattening down. Because if, if you spoke with too heavy a Yorkshire accent, the bloke from Devon wouldn't understand you. And if you used too heavy a, a Devonshire accent, the bloke from um, Edinburgh wouldn't understand you. So their language was flattened down. And the children of the convicts, that happened even more. The Australian accent arose very early from the flattening down of accents. In the 1850s, an Englishman visiting here described Australian Eng English as the most pure form of English on earth. Now, what he meant was it didn't have regional accents in it. It had been flattened down. And that has shaped the way we speak today in terms of accent. But in terms of the vocabulary, uh, what it meant was they became aware of language and sensitive to language. I think the environment contributed. Because when you try to find names for kookaburras and koalas and strange plants you've never seen before and platypuses and the rest of it, uh, they were really scrab. So they were aware of language and that sensitivity of language, which I think ended up crossing all the classes because everyone became aware of language. I think that's what made it made a push from the, the language creativity that was happening lower in society. It moved up in levels. And there, so when I joined the ABC a long, long time ago, we were told there were three Australian voices. There was middle Australian, there was broad Australian, and there was educated Australian. That was largely a product of what was called the elocution movement in the 1890s, when elocution teachers came out here and told us we were speaking wrong and telling us how to do it right. And it was taken up by some people, particularly in private schools, and ignored by most people. And right down the bottom, there was a reaction against it. Really, it was Bruce Moore, the linguist, was telling me there's a really interesting set of recordings from the 1950s talking to people who came from very re remote areas and they did not have broad Australian accents. That was something which was invented a little bit later, almost as a, a shy acting, a, a, um, a throwing off at the, the very posh accents. Generally, Australian, uh, the Australian language has been controlled by the middle. So it came from the bottom and the people at the top moved towards the middle. The language that is most common in Australia now is that middle Australian. The vocabulary and the accent have gone like that. Uh, Clive James said to me once in an interview, he said the brilliant thing about being uh, an Australian in, in Britain is, he said, they can't pigeonhole you. you anywhere, anyone who's English, they, you open your mouth and they know exactly what class you belong to. And they know what pigeonhole to put you into. He said, an Australian opens his mouth and he said, they haven't got a clue what to do with us. And so he said, people like me and Jermaine Greer, we get away uh, with being accepted for who we are and what we've done because our accent is unplaceable in a class sense. And it's because the bottom came upwards a bit, the top came downwards a bit and all met in the middle. That's where our language came from. And that we're not a classless society, but we are we are in some ways closer to a classless society than many others. 
one of the worst things about being the facilitator is that you have to be the clock watcher. So I'm going to try and squash in one more question and then we might have to wrap up, but we do have a few minutes, so. Uh, he, we, we don't know. The, the, the scholar who really studied this was a bloke named Noel McLaughlin. He's a his professional historian. He did it properly. Uh, I'm, just, I'm a storyteller, but he was a real historian. Uh, and in the 1960s, he did an enormous amount of research on, on uh, James Hardy Vox, and he did not, doesn't know where he died. We don't know where his grave is. Uh, he was arrested a, a one more time, two more times, I forget how many. Walked out of jail at the age of, I think, 61 and walks off the pages of history and we've got no idea what happened after that. He might have succeeded in going straight for his last few years. He might have died quickly. Uh, probably, in fact, I think almost certainly, he is buried under some other name. He is John Smith or some other name entirely. Uh, so we just don't know how the story ends. We have a really detailed account of his first 33 years because he told that story. Then, uh, because of Noel McLaughlin's researches, we've got a, a good picture of a lot of the rest of his life after that. And then it just suddenly stops when his last uh, prison term ends. So we, we don't know where he... But the same is true of, of a lot of convicts. Uh, it's very hard to find them buried. Frank the Poet, who's a famous early convict, uh, there are a lot of people like that. We just, we don't know where they are. So, no, we don't know how his story ended. Um, he might have lived to a great old age and died a respectable, respectable, you know, John Smith somewhere in a country town. We just don't know. So what is next for you? What's your next project going to be? I, I've got... Three books. So <laughs> what I will get to work on next, I don't know. Um, I, I do a piece for Peter Credlin called Words Matter, and it's about how word, language goes wrong, either the way we speak it or the way we construct it. And I keep getting complaints from people. Why do people say anything? This is, and there's about a 1,000 of those, so I might end up doing the book called Words Matter. And I have an idea for a book called Australia in 100 Words, taking 100 key words through our history and so on. So... No, I don't know what it will be, but it will be something. Something is coming. And so thank you all very much for coming. It's been terrific to have your company here in 3D and also on screens at home and in libraries. Kel will be around in the foyer if you have any other burning questions about Flash Jim or language. And of course, if you have a copy of your book, he'll be happy to sign that. Don't forget the festival isn't over. We've got some great sessions this afternoon. I understand that there are still a few tickets available for each of our sessions here at the library. So just contact somebody at the desk in the foyer and they can help you out. And we, even if you have a ticket for the next session and it's in this space we'd ask you to just uh, make your way out into the foyer so we can reset this room for our next panel so choose your words wisely and thank you very much for coming thanks Kel I would just I would just warn you that uh, I tend to autograph any book of mine which stays still long enough so serious book collectors are looking for an unsigned copy <laughs> <laughs>